believe that our salvation comes by just coming to church. No, coming to church is as a result of your salvation. See, if you believe that Jesus shed his blood for you, then you will also believe that you should, you will also be impelled to come to church. Because the church, with all what people say about it, it is still the group of people whom Jesus called out and purchased them with his own blood. I wish I had a church. The choice is not the building. Even though we need somewhere where we can come to worship God collectively. But the church is those persons who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord by what he has done. And so God purchased each one of us with a very, very uh, expensive commodity. The money that was used yeah. to purchase the church was very, very high in value. The blood of Jesus. Now let's see if you can put some meat on this. Hallelujah. Now, so therefore, let's conclude. Nobody can come to Jesus. You cannot have any sins forgiven unless you fully believe that Jesus has already paid the price of your sin. Now when Jesus came, Jesus entered into the holy place where the priests could not enter. And what the priests did do, the priest was only showing us what Jesus would be doing on our behalf. Because every year, this high priest, he had to enter into a place called the Holy of Holies, while the priest ministers on the outside. This priest had to go into this inner sanctum and perform a ritual, a holy ritual, on behalf of the people. And when this priest go in there, or this high priest go in there, he had to be in himself without sin. And that's why on, on the base of the priest's garments, or his phylacteries, there were bells. And as he moved around in that inner sanctum, doing the work that he ought to be doing, the bells would ring. And so, when that bell, and for any reason the bell stopped ringing, they knew that something had happened to the priest. Amen. He had died. Nobody could go in there to pull him out, so they had to take a long rope which was tied on him, and they had to pull him out, and they assumed that this high priest went in there and he was not the way he ought to be. He died doing a work that he should not have done, or he should have done, but was not prepared to do because he was unclean. That was harsh, yeah. but that was the way it was. And so, friends, based on all of what we have said just now, it is appointed unto man, all of us, once to die, and after death, comes the judgment. Now, Jesus, it took Jesus, I know you hear this often, that Jesus came to 43 generations, or 42 generations. And it simply means from Abraham, or 
or from just Adam or Abel or Seth, from Abraham straight to the time when he came, it was a series of 30 years, 42 generations until Jesus came. What they've been doing all this time, they were going into the holies of holies every year, they were offering sacrifices for sin. Don't sit with me. Now, guess what? When Jesus came, he performed some stuff. No man, the Bible said, had ever seen God at any time. The man did not know how to live because they could not understand what the law was all about. They still killed, they still lied, they still cheated, they didn't know how to live. They did not have a true example of how to live. So Jesus came. First thing he came as a baby. Heaven sent him here as a baby. He didn't come as an angel. He started as a baby. He grew up, became a man. We have very little historical facts about his upbringing other than when the Bible says that Jesus grew strong in stature yes. and he had favor with God and man. Yeah. And then we have another account of him at the age of 12 being found in the temple talking with the lawyers and the doctors. But beyond that, we saw him doing good. We saw people mistreating him. We saw him not responding back again. He did not, he was not crazy, he was not stupid. If you call him a demon, he'll tell you what demons do and why he was not a demon. He will tell you that you can't be following God and still behaving the way you are behaving. He said, look at what I am doing. If I did not do what I was sent to do, then you could call me all kinds of things. But watch my lifestyle. And so he was the kind of example of what God wants us to be. If your enemy is a hungry, feed him. Your enemy is thirsty, give him drink. If he slaps you on the one cheek, If he asks you for a coat, don't give him a coat. Give him a cloak as well as the coat. Yeah. Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. This is the kind of example that he gives. Before you, you, you try to tell a person how to live first, ensure that you're living the kind of life that you want people to live. Why do you perceive the beam or the mouth that is in my eye and you cannot see clear enough to see the mouth that is in your eye? You hypocrite! Jesus says, oh, you all going to sleep on me. Take the moat off of your eye. Judge not! And you shall not be judged. Give and it shall be given back to you in good measure. Shake it together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. These are the manifestations of the way God wants us to live. Yes. By this all men shall know that you are my disciples, if you shall have love one for the other. This is the mark that God wants you to follow. And so, at that appropriate time, when he got to Golgotha Hill, when he got to Golgotha Hill, the first thing he did, he had given the law, he demonstrated how the law ought to be, and now he's going to purchase man or a person, entire man. All Moses and those were doing, they were covering your sins. Every year, your sins was covered by the, the blood of the bulls and the goats. But when Jesus went on Calvary and shed his blood, he did not cover your sins. He purchased your redemption. He removed your sins altogether. That's what happened. Now let's go to 
I want you to take a little reading here. Let's go to um, uh, First Corinthians chapter 11. Let's go there quickly. First Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, let's see how quick we can get there. First Corinthians chapter 11. Um, uh, Corinthians chapter 11. Let us look at verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he prayed. of me after the supper. He took the cup. And when he had supped, he said, this cup is the new testament in my blood. This do as you often, as often as you do it in remembrance of me. So one of the things that the blood of Jesus, the purpose of the blood of Jesus was to secure our, our eternal redemption. That's the first thing the blood of Jesus is for, well, to secure our eternal redemption, or our salvation, our salvation. Let's talk about this word salvation for one minute. When you are saved, when you are saved, when you accept that Jesus Christ died on Calvary and that he is the son of the living God, you cannot ever have any or relationship with God unless you accept that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and that he has died for your sins. It ain't nothing to you unless you can accept that. You have to believe that. That's the only means by which you're going to get that eternal life. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is the son of of the living God, Hallelujah. and that He has purchased your sins and your freedom by His blood.